The resistance to the Vatican's directive on blessings of same-sex couples grows, but is it too late to quell the confusion? And a salacious book written by the new head of the Vatican's doctrinal office has resurfaced and it's raising eyebrows. The papal posse, Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal, are here with analysis of these stories and more. And the conflict in Gaza between Israel and Hamas continues. How long can the violence go on? And what effect is it having on stability throughout the region? Newsmax contributor and foreign policy expert Dr. Walid Fares is here with analysis. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me an X post. There'll be lots to comment on. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get into it. Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, he's the head of the Pope's doctrinal office in Rome. He's making headlines this week with a book he wrote 25 years ago on spirituality and sexuality. Nine dioceses in France at the same time have announced they will resist the new Vatican's directive on blessings of same-sex couples. Here with analysis, the Papal Posse. Editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, joins me on set. And canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray, is in New York. Happy New Year, gents. I'm so glad we could convene once again. I want to start with this controversy that's erupted around this book written by uh, Cardinal Fernandez, the Vatican's chief of doctrine. It's called Mystical Passion. It's mystical, all right. Spirituality and sensuality. And I have to say, it features a lot of blushworthy descriptions of human sexuality, spirituality, including an imaginary erotic sexual encounter with Jesus himself. Father, I'm going to spare the audience the pornographic language of this book, but at one point, Fernandez likens the encounter with God to having an orgasm in gratuitous detail. Your thoughts when you saw this story emerge? Yeah, this is shameful garbage. Uh, the fact that he wrote this, he's a priest, and he's writing about sexual experience as a person who has knowledge of it. It's most disedifying. It reveals to me he's got unhealthy preoccupations. Uh, he's certainly not uh, upholding Catholic standards of morality and decency in the way he writes this. And, um, you know, it's a fascinating study of a man who is supposed to be the guardian of orthodoxy that when this book was brought to his attention, after it was, you know, put, put out on the Internet just the other day, he said he didn't, he didn't renounce the book. He said, I just wouldn't have written this today. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea way back when. He's not distancing himself from the book, and he took measures to try and hide it after it was published, saying it could be misinterpreted. No, the problem is not it's going to be misinterpreted. The problem is people are going to read it for what it says and realize that this is a man propagating an immoral view of human sexuality. And then the other thing is this false mysticism. There's yeah. always been a history in the church of heretics who bring forth an unhealthy preoccupation with sex and then link it somehow to an experience of the divine. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not what the Catholic Church teaches about modesty and about the relationship between God, creation, and how we're supposed to approach him. Yeah, but Bob, it made me think of Rupnik, who we've been exactly. reading so much about, who had his own very perverse ideas about art and sex. Well, you know, it, it's, it, I can't even talk about the, the way he used bodily fluids and mingled them with sacraments. It was disgusting. But Fernandez is a pa attempting to pass this book off, as Father said, as something he wrote in his youth that he wouldn't write now. But subsequently, he wrote that book about kissing that was scandalous. Do you buy any of this? Well, I, I actually think it was before the, this book that he wrote the one, uh, which is called Heal Me With Your Mouth, which he said was, was not a book of theology. Yeah. <laughs> and it very clearly isn't a book of theology, <laughs> but was intended to help young people like this book was intended to help mm. uh, uh, married, I hope, married couples. Yeah. I don't think, by the way, I only have read about four chapters of the book, but it's interesting that sexuality for him has nothing to do with, with uh, reproduction. Yeah. with having children, with finding a family. Yeah. It is a very kind of abstract 
pursuit of pleasure, right? Even though he, I mean, I have to be fair to him. He says, you know, it's, this is not masturbation where you're you're by yourself. This is not mutual uh, exploitation. But where is the 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 procreative element yeah. in, in this type of of, uh, of sexuality? And the other thing is this: I, I think that the Holy Father could not help but have known about these proclivities, if we want to call them mm -hmm. that, when at that point in his life, because the book. Heal Me With Your Mouth yeah. was so notorious right. that it was actually a joke on one of the the soap operas in Argentina. <laughs> you know, they call them telenovelas, but yeah. they, it was well known that a priest had written this book yeah. about kissing and they would make jokes about yeah. it. So, you know, you can say that uh, he wouldn't write it now. It would have been a better idea not to even have written it back then. Yeah, well, but the idea that the Pope didn't know about this or people didn't know, clearly this fixation was well established long before this book reemerged. Father, years ago, Fernandez was not approved by the Vatican to become rector of the Catholic University in Argentina. Could this book have had something to do with that Passover, if you will? And uh, why wouldn't it have been, a fa it have been a factor in his appointment as head of the Vatican's doctrinal office? Yes, well, this was under the previous pope that he was denied that position. Mm -hmm. uh, it was eventually given to him. And you remember, as soon as uh, Pope Francis was elected, he promoted uh, Cardinal Fernandez now to become a bishop. And then he favored him by making him uh, archbishop of a big diocese. And then he favored him even further by bringing him to Rome. This man is manifestly unqualified to carry out the job he's been given. And it's scandalous to the world that the man who's supposed to uphold the sanctity of the word of God mm. treats uh, the subject of our divine savior as a subject for a pornographic fantasy mm. uh, involving an, an underage uh, per, a child or you know 16 year old girl, girl yeah uh, Bizarre. as described in this book it's it's disgusting yeah. if he doesn't renounce this kind of garbage that he's putting out that means he's implicitly affirming it this is ridiculous. This mm -hmm. man is, should be hang his head in shame and resign his office. Mm. Bob, given the massive scale of the abuse crisis, how was this book seemingly not a factor in the appointment of Fernandez? And I mean, for a cleric to write about, I mean, I, I, genitalia, erections, I mean, I, I, I can't really describe it or read it. I was going to put quotes up, but it's too filthy to put quotes up. Why should I destroy our airtime? Why did this set off no alarms? That's a very good question. I mean, I, I have to think that he very quickly realized that he'd made a big mistake. But he said he, he, he withdrew the book and he didn't want it to be republished because it might be misunderstood. Now, that said, everybody still has a track record. And, and, you know, some track records, I mean, all of us are flawed. We know we're all, all sinful. But some of the track record kind of, you have to say, it, it kind of disqualifies you for further, uh, further steps along the pathway toward promotion within the church. And yet, somehow, after having these two rather uh, salacious uh, publications early on in his life, even if he, he, he went on to other things, it made no difference. He continued to, to rise, and he was very close with Jorge Mario Bergoglio, and eventually now he's become head of the dicastery. So it, it's, a, it's a mystery how someone with that kind of background at this point. Now, that said, the, the, the abuse crisis had not yet erupted the way it did here in the United States. But any, any sane leader of a diocese and of the whole church is going to take into account the character of the people that he appoints to very sensitive, very powerful positions. And in this case, it is just eye-popping that yeah. this comes out now. And, and by the way, this people are trying to portray this as a hit, a personal hit against him. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, you don't look at somebody unless the, with this degree of, of scrutiny, unless they're, they are in a very powerful situation. And I think that as people begin to, to, to comb back through his other publications, we may see some other surprises yeah, as well. This would make Jackie Collins blush. I mean, this <laughs> stuff is, this is randy and filthy to the nth degree. Uh, Father, it appears that Fernandez tried to disappear this book. You can't find it in a used bookstore. It's nowhere to be found. The, the ISDN number is gone. My question is, might this have been a reason for his decision to no longer deal with abuse cases when he came to the, to the dicastery of the doctrine of faith? Yeah, it was very uh, curious when he was appointed to that. 
Uh, he told the Pope that he didn't want to deal with those cases, and the Pope wrote a letter to him at that time saying that they would be handled by, you know, the disciplinary section of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. But since he dabbles in pornography, uh, he's obviously someone who would feel a little uncomfortable in having to judge people who do the same when they're committing crimes against minors. So uh, <clears throat> how can we put the... Can you imagine any other organization, the head of its integrity section, having someone who displays this complete lack of good sense and, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, displays as something that would be done by people you know, we call them pornographers in the back alleys in the old days. These are shameful acts being described for public consumption. And Fernandez then has the preposterous claim that this is all part of a spirituality for couples. Mm -hmm. Nonsense. Nonsense. This is paganism. Yeah, no, I, I have to say I was shocked, not by the descriptions. I mean, look, we've all read these words. We're adults. We see this. The problem, the thing that struck me, it made me feel, frankly, sick to my stomach, it's blasphemous because you're not just saying, oh, look, here's two people having a sexual act. It's Jesus as one of the participants. I mean, this is really mind-boggling and mind-blowing, frankly, that anybody would even conjure such things, much less give word to them. Bob, I'll give you the last word on this topic. Yeah, and uh, I mean, to add a rather disgusting detail, it, it, I don't know why you bring forward that story, first of all, in, yeah. in any kind of context. No. But he says that the girl reports that the Blessed Mother was looking on approvingly yeah. as this happened. Yeah, th this is, I mean, it, it's, it's like a sexual twisted fantasia. And anybody who thinks this way, I think you've got to really question what else are they thinking and why would you make that person head of your doctrinal office globally? I want to move on to the growing resistance to the Vatican Directive, which is kind of the piece de resistance of this uh, dicastery on doctrine. It's the blessing of same-sex couples or those in irregular situations, divorced and remarried Catholics, without an annulment. Nine Catholic dioceses in France are rejecting the document, and the former head of the Dicastery to, for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, Cardinal Robert Serra, is issuing a strong rejection of the document. He writes, We do not oppose Pope Francis, but we firmly and radically oppose a heresy that seriously undermines the Church, the body of Christ, because it is contrary to the Catholic faith and tradition. Father, papal apologist Austin Ivory wrote this week that Cardinal Sarah has accused the Pope of heresy and thus has violated his oath of loyalty to the Pope and he should give up his red hat. Your thoughts on what Cardinal Sarah actually said there and what does it mean canonically? Yeah, Cardinal Sarah is expressing uh, the common opinion of people who look at this document and compare it with what's been taught by every pope up till this moment and saying that this is not true. Uh, there are heretical teachings contained in fiducius supplicans. Now, this document was issued under the title of the Congregation or the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, and then in it we find Pope Francis's signature and Cardinal Fernandez as the pope approved it. So, you know, in reality, it's the document of the dicastery, but the Pope approved it, and his name appears on it, so he's giving his approval to what's said in it. So sad to say, the Pope has approved something that he never should have, because it teaches wrongly that the Catholic Church considers homosexual couples a worthy subject to receive a blessing as couples. That is horrible. That's teaching basically that the immortal, excuse me, mortal sin committed by homosexuals is not a big deal. And in fact, they deserve a blessing. And it's equating them to all other couples, married couples, engaged couples, by calling them couples. They're not couples. They're two people who are misusing their bodies with each other. This has nothing to do with how a couple is conceived in Catholic theology. Uh, Bob, uh, he, he, Ivory goes to great pains to try to say that Cardinal Sarah is calling the Pope a heretic. That is not what he did. Yeah. He said that this teaching is heresy. What's the difference? Well, look, as we know, there's been this, this just this pile up of are, are we blessing unions? Are we blessing mm -hmm. couples? Are we blessing individuals? Yeah, that's a, yeah. And for me, at this point, I mean, that debate can go on till the end of time, and it really doesn't make all that much of a difference right now. Yes, there is a formal reaffirmation that only sex within uh, a Christian marriage is permissible. But I forget who said this, and I apologize to whoever, whoever it was, because it's a great image. 
someone wrote that saying to, to try to 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 keep this distinction that we haven't formally said that that's okay. It's like when you go out on a blind date and someone asks you how did it go, and you said the food the food at the restaurant was terrific. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean you you've told a yeah. truth, yeah. but you haven't actually dealt with the the, the backstory that's right. out there. And I just wrote about this the other day at the Catholic thing. I think that for, uh, when we want to judge what does this actually mean in action, we have to look at the fruits of what is produced. It's not only in France. Yeah. It's all over Africa. Yep. You know, it's in Hungary. Hungary it's in yep. Poland. It's in all these different places. Hundreds of priests in England, hundreds of, hundreds of priests in, in Spain are, are protesting this, and they won't do these blessings. Mm -hmm. So the, what are the fruits of this? The fruits of this aren't an outreach of charity to these so-called irregular couples. It is chaos, it's confusion, it's conflict within the church, and that has to be a, a, a judgment about the prudence, even over and above yeah. the theological questions, the prudence of issuing this yeah. at this moment in history. Yeah. Uh, Cardinal Sarah also co condemns compromise with the world in terms of morality. He quotes Pope Francis in his own words, uh, where, the, where the Pope says the devil is the divider and that this document is causing seeming division to bless sin. Uh, I want, I'll get both of you to react to that, but, but Father, uh, Ivory perhaps is speaking once again as the unofficial spokesman for the Pope. Might this be a warning shot to Cardinal Sarah? Could he be the next Cardinal Burke? Well, I hope not, because Cardinal Sarah has only done his duty as a cardinal to uphold the Catholic faith. And Cardinal Fernandez has not upheld the Catholic faith with fiducia supplicans, and the Pope has not upheld the Catholic faith with fiducia supplicans. Uh, this is, we have to be very frank and blunt here that all of these bishops in Africa are not mistaken in what they understand this document to mean. Mm -hmm. You'll recall that Father James Martin, a day after this came out, had his picture in the New York Times, where was a reporter conveniently invited, when he blessed two homosexuals who we find out are civilly married. Hmm. Those two homosexuals consider themselves to be married. You know what that means? They don't believe the Catholic doctrine on marriage, that only a man and a woman can marry. So here are two people who are living in an immoral relationship who implicit or explicitly reject Catholic doctrine by the way they live, and now they're being blessed. When you see that being done by a priest, by the way, no wonder the bishops in the world are looking at us and wait a minute. When in the history of the Catholic Church did we ever say God will favor people who commit unnatural sex acts with each other, consider themselves to be married, and we're just going to give them a blessing as if they were married, all the while saying we're not really blessing their union because a union is different than a couple, nonsense. Hmm. It's not a marriage, absolutely. It can't be. But when people are deluded and think they're married, we shouldn't contribute to that delusion by this nonsense of blessing them. You'd have to be very, very naive I, I don't want to say dense necessarily, <laughs> not to think that there was going to be a huge reaction from the bishops. Yeah. Now, Fern Cardinal Fernandez says in his clarification about yeah. the original document that bishops can, cannot say that it is theologically wrong because yes. they've, they've reaffirmed uh, marriage. However, what, what, what we have going on here is an abuse, at, I would have to say, at both ends, because the, in the other way, we have priests out there who are going to be put in very, very difficult circumstances for not doing what we just saw in that, that photograph. And look, we have to also bring uh, up the fact that lots of bishops, lots of priests, maybe even lots of cardinals are laying low at this point. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the braver ones and the ones who are in situations in Africa where they know that the Muslims and it's the life the, or death and, and the uh, the evangelicals and the the, um, the other Protestant sects are just waiting for them to make this move to move in on the, on their people. Yep. There have to be vast swaths of people who are staying quiet for the time being. There is a massive resistance to this, and yep. I think the Vatican at some point is going to have to find a way to exit from the place that it's gotten itself into. Mm. Father, what do you make of the optics here? I mean. As we were discussing a moment ago, it, it, aren't these wedding blessings inevitable? How long before church blessings prohibited, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the limitations on these blessings are completely disregarded? I know they can't wear the same outfits and they can't be in a church setting, but remember, Vatican II said you were supposed to sing Latin in the new mass. That was dropped, too. Yeah, this is all meaningless, Raymond. Uh, restrictions on what kind of clothing you can wear, what you can do. 
Uh, Cardinal Fernandez says the, uh, the, the, the casual or non-liturgical blessing only take, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. This is all nonsense. What's really at stake here is, does the Catholic Church consider homosexual activity, sodomy, to be a mortal sin? Do people who promise to commit this sin with each other on an ongoing basis, are they blessable in that promise, in that relationship? The Vatican has said yes. The Vatican may deny it by saying, we don't bless unions, we only bless couples. That's double talk. The only reason they're considered a couple is because they've united themselves to each other through their own intention, and in many cases through getting a civil marriage. So, no, what's, what's inevitably going to happen here is that the Catholic bishops and faithful of the world have to tell the Holy See, we do not believe that immor immorality is blessable, and therefore we reject this innovation. This innovation of a blessing of what's immoral will not stand, and that's got to be quite crystal clear to Pope Francis and the others. And that's an act of charity, by the way. If the Pope or any of his assistants make a mistake, to keep your mouth shut and pretend they're right is wrong. To tell them with charity but with forthrightness, you've made a mistake here, Holy Father, that's the charity. That's the charity that St. Paul showed to St. Peter. Uh, Archbishop Charles Shiluna, who is a senior advisor to the Pope, he's an adjunct secretary of the doctrinal office. This week, he's calling for the Church to rethink its stance on celibacy. Here's the quote. This is probably the first time I'm saying it publicly, and it will sound heretical to some people. If it were up to me, I would revise the requirement that priests have to be celibate. Experience has shown me that this is something we need to seriously think about, Archbishop Charles Shiluna. What are we seeing here? I mean, it, 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 is it just that everyone is watching the clock and it's about to run out on this papacy, so it's like the Blue Light Synodal Special, we got to get all we can before the light turns out? Yeah, I think this is a further compromise, to use that term that you, mm. you invoked earlier, that somehow these people kind of think that Catholicism doesn't work. That the, the, the practices and the disciplines that we've had in the past simply don't work. I think that's a false uh, assessment of where things are. But to change the nature of the priesthood is not necessarily heretical. Yeah. The Eastern churches, of course, have married right. priests, not married bishops, but married priests. But I, I think that um, this might be a trial balloon that maybe mm. some people in the Vatican want to see. The Holy Father, surprisingly, if you remember during the, the Synod on uh, the Amazon yeah. uh, was was edging toward that, but kind, of, but kind of rejected it. But he tends to do this. He tends to himself or let other people yeah. have these trial balloons and then see where things go. I, I just find this to be a, a further weakening. It sends out the message that the yeah the Catholic Church really wants to get on board with with where the sexual revolution has gone in the West. It hasn't gone there, there in Africa no, and in, 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 not even in Latin America. So I mean, this is uh, this this is the leading edge of yet maybe the next step mm. that may be tried. Father, as Bob said, many people don't realize. I bet some of our viewers in the eastern branch of the Catholic Church there are married priests, as there are on the ordinariate. But why the urgency, and who is pushing this? Well, I was very surprised when Archbishop Shaklunas said that, but I do recall what Bob just said at the Synod on the Amazon. That was on the agenda, yep. you know, ordaining married men. They were going to be older men, so they were trying to, you know, ease it in by saying <laughs> only the older folks will get ordained. But then you may recall Cardinal Sarah and Pope Benedict uh, Emeritus published a book in defense of priestly celibacy. Mm -hmm. And that book was tremendous. It was prophetic. It was a beautiful defense of priestly celibacy is coming from Christ. You know, that Christ is the, is, the, is the celibate, and so are his priests who represent him. So anyway, that died. It went nowhere. And now it's coming back on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, this, as Bob said, this is caving into the world, pretending that the Catholic faith and life is, can't work in the modern world. It's just the exact opposite. Wherever Catholicism is taken seriously, uh, the seminaries are full. Africa, I know from experience dealing with African priests, some of the seminaries have to turn men away because there aren't enough spaces there. Right. How about the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Latin mass groups? They're often turning away candidates. They don't have enough room. So where Catholicism is vigorous, orthodox, robust, traditional, things go well. And we ought to think about that because, yeah, Archbishop Shaklunas, a recipe here would be a total disaster. Yeah. It, it would destroy, in the popular appreciation, the Catholic Church is teaching that 
uh, giving up sex for the sake of the kingdom of God is a blessed and holy thing, and it's very possible. It's been done for 2,000 years. He would basically say, it doesn't work anymore. Let's get rid of it. No. Wrong. He's got the wrong idea here. Hmm. Pope Francis, in his homily on the Feast of the Epiphany, had this to say about what he labels ecclesiastical ideologies. Instead of splitting into groups based on our own ideas, we are called to put God back at the center. We need to let go of ecclesiastical ideologies so that we can discover the meaning of Holy Mother Church, the ecclesial habitus. Ecclesiastical ideologies, no. Ecclesial vocation, yes. The Lord, not our own ideas or our own projects, must be at the center. Uh, Bob, just what are ideological or ecclesiastical ideologies? What does the Pope mean by this? Well, uh, it might be cynical to say it's the things that he doesn't like that are going on in the church. Uh -huh. But um, look, toward the end of the, the year, he said some striking things. I and mean, just this past week, he condemned surrogacy. Yes, he, he did. He, he, he spoke out about abortion toward the end of the year and, you know, and other things like that. I really think that the way around so-called ideologies of the left and the right is to go back to Catholicism, to recognize that we need a redefinition, especially on these sexual matters. We, we need a document like, God help us, Amoris Laetitia, that actually confronts the, the very vigorous, militant, pro-abortion, um, pro-homosexual, uh, sexual revolution um, currents that, that exist in our developed nations at this point. That's really where the battle to, to move off of ideologies is going to be solved. Now, he may regard that as as uh, playing to one wing in the church, which th that's the center of the church, affirming families, affirming yeah. societies that depend on, on virtuous families and virtuous individuals. That's the, the true way to get beyond ideology, but, but, in my estimation. But, uh, Father, I want to bring you in on this. Wouldn't synodality hmm. be considered an ecclesiastical ideology? Well, I mean, what about holding on to church teaching and doctrine? Is that an ideology now? What does he mean by ecclesiastical ideology? That's not right or left. That's something other. Well, we don't really know because he hasn't told us. I mean, if, if he uses the plural, so that means there, an ideology is commonly means a set of ideas. Mm. So if there are sets of ideas that he doesn't b believe are compatible with the Catholic faith, tell us what they are. Warn, you know, the shepherd should warn the sheep what to avoid. Uh, synodality, in effect, has become, though, in my opinion, an ideology because there's no history in the Catholic Church of what we saw in last October where the bishops of the Catholic Church sit down with lay people and they have an equal vote in trying to come up with a pastoral program to guide the church in the modern era. And by the way, about synodality, isn't it fascinating? At the synod, they were going to talk about homosexuality. It never made it to the final uh, discussion or report. And suddenly it gets sprung on us here just before Christmas that homosexual couples can be blessed. Well, Fernandez tells us in Fiducia that this, was, uh, this document was under discussion while the synod was going on. So there's a cynical game going on here where they say we're going to talk about something and bring it, you know, to the people of God and for their consideration. They never tell us they've got a document already in the works that they're going to publish. I, I, for me, the way the Holy See has conducted itself within the last six months has been disedifying, disheartening, discouraging, and it certainly is not bringing the unity of the faith or the dynamic mission of the church to bring the truth of Christ to the world, we seem to be aping the world and trying to give them everything they want. Yeah, and pulling political games and Swifties behind the scenes on people. And you know, oh, we're going to bring it, we're going to let everybody have their voice heard, and then we're just going to do it in the dead of night, and here you go. Just, it's done. Agree. Obey. Before we run out of time, I want to talk about the number of USCs that could become vacant soon, prompting new appointments by Pope Francis. Cardinal Sean O'Malley in Boston is 79. Cardinal Timothy Dolan in New York, 73. Detroit, Cincinnati, Mobile, Milwaukee, Galveston, Houston, all could be up for appointments very soon. Those who Pope Francis enjoys and likes the company of, they're allowed to stay. But those he does not favor tend to be replaced at lightning speed. Bob, given what we have been seeing with the men Francis has chosen in recent days, what do you foresee? Well, I think it's going to be a tough time uh, in the next couple of years as far as these appointments go, because although um, 
Francis has tried to lift up the peripheries, which means people who are not really in the kind of progressive mode in the church. When it comes to appointments here in the United States, some of them I think have been good, a small number have been good, um, which is to say non-progressive, I think you know, more orthodox in, in their orientation. But by and large, the, the, the people in the most important seas have tended to be along this progressive line, a kind of a synodal line, and I think that we're gonna see people Particularly for this country, I don't know exactly who he listens to. Uh, we might speculate about who that is, well, but you who's, know, who's on the bishop's congregation? Yeah. But and Supich and and. Uh, right. But whoever it is that he listens to, in particular here in the United States, by and large, he's been appointing people of that more progressive uh, direction. Mm -hmm. And given that most of our bishops are still in the JP two and Benedict mold, this for I mean, even within the church, this is going to cause tensions. Yeah. And then in in terms of the way publicly. Uh, Catholicism presents itself. You have to think, if our bishops had been strong enough not to allow the Nancy Pelosi's and the Joe Bidens to go on their merry way as Catholics promoting abortion and homosexuality and all sorts of trans uh, uh, people and whatnot, you know, America might actually have been different. But our bishops didn't, d didn't hold the line on that, and we're paying the price for it right now. Mm -hmm. I think Father, I'm going to give you the last word. How might these appointments change the face of the church, not only in the United States, globally, and what impact could all of the stories we've been discussing tonight have on the next conclave? Well, yes, uh, I, certainly these are important sees that are going to be uh, new nominations, new bishops being put there, particularly cardinal Lachial sees, New York and uh, uh, Boston. Uh, Detroit was formerly a cardinal Lachial see. Uh, Houston is, uh, Houston Galveston. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if the Pope, uh, you know, is more robust and healthy than, uh, you know, people think, uh, you know, that he's, he's in declining health, but if he lasts for a couple more years, we're going to have a whole new set of bishops and, and archbishops who have great importance. Now, what I think on the conclave question, whenever that happens, uh, the battle lines are drawn between those who support the notion the Catholic teaching on sexual morality is inadequate and needs to be updated and changed, and that's basically what they're saying here as regards blessing homosexual couples, uh, and those who say, no, we can't do that. And uh, I foresee that the, uh, the next conclave is going to be uh, very tense uh, in the pre-discussions beforehand. Certainly the media circus is going to be quite active, mm -hmm. but I think it'll be a moment where people, you know, who look to the gospel and to Christ as the center of our religion are going to say, what are we doing to promote the faith of our fathers as opposed what is, has, has been done recently to accommodate to the world? And we have to take that first course. We have to find out how it is that we can reorient the church in a way that the gospel is first and not these secular concerns pleasing the world. Gentlemen, we will leave it there for commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray and re uh, regular podcasts. Visit thecatholicthing.org. Thank you, gents. <laughs> The Israeli-Hamas conflict continues in the Middle East, and the Islamic State is launching attacks in Iran. Meanwhile, the strain of the U.S. southern border and the massive influx of humanity that results is creating distraction from U.S. domestic security. How might the unrest in the Middle East affect us here in the United States? Join me now with analysis of these stories and many more. Foreign policy expert at Newsmax and author of the recent book, Iran, an imperialist republic and U.S. policy. Dr. Walid Fares joins us. Walid, thanks for being here. Uh, U.S. Secretary Anthony Blinken is back in the Middle East this week with the intent to ward off an escalating conflict. On Monday, he said that Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as Turkey, have agreed to begin planning for the reconstruction and governance of Gaza once Israel's war with Hamas ends. What influence does the U.S. have with these nations, and how much influence will it have over the rebuild in Gaza? Well, first of all, Raymond, uh, the, big, the big question, the prelude to this, how does the secretary imagine that the Gaza war will end? Mm -hmm. Is it reconstruction with Hamas, which is what Turkey and Qatar would like to see, mm -hmm. or is it reconstruction after Hamas, which is what Israel, the Arab allies, and eventually the United States, at least the Congress, would like to see. That's a big question, and I'm and I'm asking this because until now, this administration's policy in the Middle East since October and even before October has been captured 
by that interest in re-signing the Iran deal. And re-signing the Iran deal, you and I discussed it for years, yep. it means more billion dollars going to the Iran regime in Tehran. And what do they do with the money? They obviously su support Hamas, support Hezbollah, support all of these militias. So for the Biden administration to even think about a post-Hamas uh, reconstruction, they have to determine a new policy with regard to Iran. An Israeli airstrike Monday in southern Lebanon killed an elite Hezbollah commander. This is the latest in an escalating exchange of strikes along that border that have raised fears of yet another Mideast war, even as the fighting continues in Gaza. Do you see the potential of these continued strikes in Lebanon leading to an all-out war in the region? Listen, both sides, Israel and Hezbollah, are fighting each other. Remind me of the World War II situation before before Germany invaded France. There was the phony war, Droldoguer, where they mm. exchanged fire, you know, shoots against each other. It was right. not yet the full-fledged war. What we have right now is that Iran has told Hezbollah, you are going to get some heat on Israel. We need that heat, but don't go too far, because the Iranians still believe that at one point in time there'll be a ceasefire. In Gaza and Israel basically would lose. And they do believe that the Houthis in Yemen are yeah. going to put so much pressure on the international community that there will be a ceasefire. Only when Tehran decides that Hezbollah will have to go into an open war, then we're going to see major changes in Lebanon, in Syria, and potentially even in Iraq. Yeah, I want to talk about that, what's happening there uh, in the Red Sea. It's a major story that gets too little coverage. But amid U.S. de escalation efforts, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told The Wall Street Journal that the fight against Hamas must serve to dissuade other Iran-backed proxies in the region from launching their own attacks. It's just what we're talking about. He said, we are fighting an axis, not a single enemy. Iran is building up military power around Israel in order to use it. Walid, what are your thoughts on this move by Israel to escalate the war in light of the threat from Iran? And will they be successful against this Iranian regime? I remember our discussions over the years, Raymond, yep. how many times we drew the map of Iran mobilizing its militias, its forces coming around Israel, and it decided at one point that the war will start in Gaza, but it does not mean that this war will stay in Gaza. As we just said now, Hezbollah is ready to open a war from the north, Syrian Iran militias from the Golan Heights, and these missiles being fired now from Iraq. So the question is going to be this. Will the United States stand with Israel as it is escalating in Gaza? Escalation is a word, but we need to understand what it means. Either Israel will end Hamas or it won't end Hamas. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't end Hamas, Hamas too will come back. And this time it will have a lot of international recognition and money. That is not something Israel can afford. So the only option they have is to dismantle Hamas, to get to the Egyptian border on the one hand. More important is to replace Hamas with a legitimate, peaceful, Palestinian new authority that would go in the direction of the Abraham Accords, not of the Iranian Islamic Republic. Mm. That's what ultimate yeah. objectives. Yeah. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was visiting troops near the Israeli-Lebanon uh, border, and he vowed to do everything possible to return security to the north, adding, we prefer that this be done without a wider campaign, but that won't stop us. Will Prime Minister Netanyahu be influenced, do you think, by the U.S.? We heard Biden the other day say, I'm working with him to de-escalate the war. Or will he ignore Western advice and forge ahead with the war in the North? I think time-wise, uh, options are very limited now. Uh, this administration is entering its election years, and we know what's going on uh, over mm -hmm. here. So its ability to interfere and pressure the Israelis or any other ally, including the Arabs uh, in Yemen or elsewhere, is going to be limited and limited till about September, October, and then we won't be able to do anything serious before a new administration or the same administration, I think a new administration uh, next year. So that time, basically, the Israelis will take it to achieve as much as they can on the ground and then call this administration or better, the next administration, to help in securing a convention, a peace convention in a region, as I said, after Hamas and potentially after Hezbollah, we will see, that would secure peace seriously for the future. During his trip to the Middle East, Blinken met with the Saudi crown prince. He met separately with the United Arab Emirates president to discuss what post-war Gaza might look like. Now, according to reports, Blinken said that any plan has to include a unified Palestinian government for the West Bank and Gaza. 
The region must pave a way for an independent Palestinian state. Waleed, you mentioned it a moment ago. How late likely is a Palestinian state, and who is going to run the place? Well, the administration is silent about that matter. I think members of Congress are not. There won't be a Hamas government. There won't be a Hamas backed by Iran participation in any government. It's, it's two different directions. Right. So who will be in Gaza, basically? The new Palestinian government, which, as I said earlier, now repeat one more time, will be recognizing the state of Israel, will actually be members of the Abraham Accord. We will have cooperation mm -hmm. with them. And that is the government that would rule Gaza and the West Bank, not the other way around, not the government in the West Bank that will rule Gaza. It will be mm -hmm. this new Palestinian uh, force on the ground that will... It's like France and, and, and Germany after war, they became friends and allies. That's what the United States should be doing with the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, looking for new Palestinians. Yeah. And there's an ongoing standoff between, and you mentioned it a moment ago, Yemen's uh, Houthi rebels and the international coalition led by the U.S. over commercial shipping. We've seen several attacks by these Houthi rebels on ships in the Red Sea. On Monday, Blinken posted this tweet, again, a tweet, this conflict must not expand. We condemn the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, one of the busiest trade corridors, which has disrupted or diverted nearly 20 percent of global shipping. And he goes on and on and on. Here's my question, Wally. How significant are these attacks? And is there a danger that the U.S. is going to be pulled into a conflict with these Houthis uh, and, by default, Iran? These are their proxies. Raymond, for years, again, on your show and other shows, we have implored, we have asked uh, the various administrations from the time of the Obama administration to deal with the Houthis, or at least don't do anything. Allow the Saudis and the UAE mm -hmm. and the Arab alliance, which was present on the ground, they were about to push the Houthis to reunify Yemen and to give, you know, rights for all Yemenis. Instead, what did we do? Because of the pressures of the Iran lobby that exists in Washington, as we all know, we pressured the Saudis to stop their campaign against the Houthis. Now we're paying the price. We had a very wrong policy, and now we are harvesting the problems of this policy. So, yeah, the United States, the international community, the alliance, the Arab coalition, all together should be resolving the issue of the Houthis, which means disarming the Houthis, not waiting for them, for, for them to become reasonable. They're not reasonable because they are funded, controlled, trained, by the Iran Islamic Republic. Hmm. I got to ask you about a situation in Iran. Uh, a woman named, a young woman named Roya Hesmati, she shared hmm. horrific uh, or, or an ordeal she went through of receiving yeah. 74 lashes for refusing to cover her hair. Now, despite her punishment, she remained defiant. She refused to wear the hijab during and after her lashing. She sang courageously, quote, in the name of women, in the name of life, the chains of slavery have been torn apart, end quote. Wally, what are we seeing from the youth of Iran today as they endeavor to fight this regime? And what is the situation on the ground? What you've seen, what you've mentioned right now, this young Iranian determined woman who, despite all these punishments administered against her, is the new Iran. That's why the regime is panicking, because millions and millions of young Iranians, mostly women and girls and youth and, of course, minorities, all joining the Iranian people since last fall, the fall of last year, they have been in a state of revolution. And let me say this. We're not going to find a resolution of the Iranian regime threat except through a revolution on the inside. It's not mm -hmm. a war against Iran. It's going to be a revolution within Iran yeah. that is going to change the regime. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why Iran ordered Hamas to attack Israel, to divert full attention into mm -hmm. Gaza and Hamas. And now you are raising this issue that everybody in the media in America should be raising and in Europe. Thank you for raising the issue. This is a yeah. specimen an example yeah. of what is going on in Iran against the Iranian yeah. people. Final question, and this is an important one we've been covering for a long, long time. The U.S. State Department just released their Religious Freedom Watch List, okay? These are countries they prioritize as places of concern because of the religious intolerance there and, in many cases, slaughter. For the third year in a row, Walid, Nigeria does not appear on that watch list. We just saw 200 Christians murdered during the Christmas season. Some 17,000 churches have been torched since 2009. Why wasn't Nigeria considered a country of particular concern by this administration? 
I would quickly say oil, and then I'll have to explain it. But let me say this. With regard to Nigeria, it's in the same policy as in Afghanistan, as in Iran, as we've seen around the world. But more specifically, in Nigeria, there is a systematic jihadi movement trying to ethnic cleanse, and I repeat, ethnic cleanse mm -hmm. uh, Nigerians from the plateau in the central of the country, from Biafra now, the, south, uh, the th southeast. And that is absurd that the international community, including the United States, including Europe, are not raising the issue to the level that we should be addressing. And we have thousands and thousands of multiple ethnicities. Yes, they are Christian because the, the jihadists are the ones driving this. Some Muslims also have been targeted, but the Christians of Nigeria are under dire threats in the midst of a big, major silence in the international community. Walid, always great to have you here. We're going to leave it there. Iran, an imperialistic republic, and U.S. policy is available now in bookstores everywhere. Walid Ferris, thank you as always for being here. Thank you, Raymond. Pell contra mundum, Pell against the world. In it, you highlight Cardinal Pell's role as a defender of orthodoxy in chaotic and confusing times. I mean, he certainly was a prophet. Uh, I spoke with him on the show in June of 2021, and I asked Cardinal Pell then about the German synodal way, but not even he could imagine that the aberrations in the German church would soon be embraced by the global synod in Rome as well. Watch this. I don't know whether abortion and euthanasia are on the books. Uh, but I hope not, but uh, certainly they want to change the teaching on, uh, some do, on sexual morality by blessing homosexual unions. Uh, they object to the tough teachings of Jesus on uh, adultery and against remarriage. Uh, they seem to have a different list of uh, qualities that are necessary for the fruitful reception of the sacraments, different from that of St. Paul. And some of them would uh, want to have an order of w women priests. Now, uh, we can't have a German set of the Ten Commandments, and we uh, can't have a, a, a set of uh, women priests in Germany and nowhere, nowhere else. Father, your reaction to that, particularly that line, they want to change church teaching, it's really haunting. Yeah, it, it's so good to hear his voice. And isn't it remarkable that uh, you said that was in June, and here it could be the the front page of the news today because now it's moved not just from Germany, it's moved from Germany to the Universal Church because this is exactly the kind right. of thing with great ambiguity too because at the beginning they said, no, we're not here to change church teaching. But now as we've gone through two and almost three weeks of the Synod, we see this coming to the fore, that we're laying the foundations, one cardinal said, for the changes that will take place and will address those concrete changes he said next year, because remember that the Senate is in two parts, so there'll be in 2024, there'll be another part of it. But that's exactly why I edited this book. I was with the Cardinal, um, you know, quite a bit just before he died. And um, these were the concerns that were uh, on his mind that he wrote about. In fact, uh, the essay that he wrote for the London Spectator is the uh, lead uh, article in this uh, book. Yep. And, and, Father, talk, talk for a moment about the significance of that Latin title, Pell Contra Mundum. Um, I mean, you include three addresses here by Cardinal of course. Pell, all given in the last six months of his life. But go ahead, tell me about the title. Why yes. that? Yes. Well, of course, Pell Contra Mundum is a play on the Athanasius Contra Mundum, because remember that Athanasius... Um, was very concerned at the Council of Nicaea when the whole world, Jerome said, the whole world woke up and found itself Arian. So this, the Arian heresy was the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ, a very core fundamental part of the church's deposit of revelation. And, and um, Athanasius fought against that uh, under very difficult circumstances. He was exiled twice, and the phrase emerged Athanasius contra mundum. So I saw that this was exactly the role that Pell was playing, and I wanted to ensure that his voice would still be heard at this synod, which is why this book is published in four languages and has been distributed to every cardinal throughout the world. 
you contributed your own essay to the book, as did George Weigel and the Archbishop of Bombay, Cardinal uh, Gracia, yes. as you mentioned him earlier. And uh, in that essay by Cardinal Gracias, titled George Pell, White Martyr, um, he goes into some of the uh, really delicate and, and heartbreaking details of the time Pell spent in prison in Australia for crimes he didn't commit, and how that shaped the man he yes. would become in his final years of his life. Reflect on that essay, if you would. Uh, well, he pointed out the 404 days were like a retreat for Pell. That's what Pell said. And it produced these three volumes of very uh, rich spiritual reflections uh, on his time in prison. And what you see there, in, in yeah, a very mundane reflection uh, uh, on his time there and uh, his attachment to the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, I think it's a very powerful witness in that he comes out without rancor, without hatred, uh, and uh, toward anyone. And uh, mm -hmm. he's a great model in that Cardinal Gracious, who knew the man well and didn't always agree with him, uh, acknowledges mm -hmm. that. Yeah. In your essay, Father, you write, uh, the essential question Pell labored to raise in his last days comes down to this. Does the Church exist by virtue of a divine mandate, a deposit of faith entrusted to the apostles intended from the beginning to be handed down faithfully from one generation to another intact? Father, up until now, it seems that Cardinal Pell and we in the Church would count on that continuity and could. What do you think is the answer to that question today, now, as this synod closes? Well, the, the, this is what we all pledge. This is what we pledge in our, our baptismal uh, promises at Easter. We pledge it in our priestly ordinations. This is the fundamental of the faith. And this is being explicitly negotiated away in the name of modern research and openness and walking with people. Now, we want to be open to people. We want uh, to walk with people who are hurt. We want to embrace those who are on the margins. It's not a question of whether we love people or don't love people. It's a, it's a question of whether we uh, propose to them the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth of Jesus Christ is stable. It's dependable. And it is unalterable. And it can be developed and applied in different circumstances, of course, but we have to have that uh, continuity of teaching and the safeguards around that, which, and in that essay, I also draw the connection to Newman, because uh, in many ways, Pell was like a Newman. He, uh, he was not afraid to engage the issues of his day. He was in court. Uh, Newman was in court. Uh, he, um, wrote himself into the Catholic Church precisely on this point of the development of Christian doctrine. How does it authentically mm -hmm. develop? How does it go from the implicit to the explicit? Not a change or a reversal of its teaching and its insight, but an amplification and a clarification of the truths of the faith. That's what Newman mm -hmm. was about. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what Pell was about. And Newman, you'll remember, was called the silent father of the Second Vatican Council. My mm -hmm. effort is to ensure that Pell's voice is here, that he is here as a silent father of this synod. Before we go, you include an essay written by Cardinal Pell right before he passed. It was published posthumously. It was titled, The Catholic Church Must Free Itself from This Toxic Nightmare, referencing the synod. It includes the ominous warning to his brother bishops, yes. quote, the synods have to choose whether they are servants and defenders of the apostolic tradition on faith and morals or whether their discernment compels them to assert a sovereignty over Catholic teaching. So far, the synodal way has neglected, indeed downgraded, the transcendent covered up the centrality of Christ with appeals to the Holy Spirit and encouraged resentment, especially among the participants. Father Sirico, the first portion of this Synod on Synodality is wrapping up next week. How prophetic are those words, and what do you want readers to take from this Pell Contramundum, this book? 
uh, astoundingly prophetic. I mean, he he nails it completely. Remember, he died uh, in in January. There's almost a year, and he nailed the thing precisely. And this is a call to bishops to be bishops, to be another Athanasius, to stand against the trends. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.